Holy God, you stir within us and speak to us in surprising ways. You get us into good trouble. Open us to your presence here in our midst. Stir within us, speak to us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with the light. And those of you who wish to do so may also light your first three Advent candles at home so we share in this ritual together in the journey of Advent. And we will now begin the Advent candle lighting with Paula and Dave. I dream of music that makes my heart swell. I dream of trees that take my breath away. I dream of sunrises that wrap me in light. I dream of family dinners that feel like home. I dream of worship that gives me hope. I dream of saying yes to love. So today, as we draw near to Christmas, we light the candle of love. May this candle burn brightly, reminding us that God is light, that God is here, that God is love. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. 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 My soul magnifies the hear the call to worship, Barbara Harris. I knew joy, but when I heard the laughter of a child. Suddenly, joy was overflowing. I knew love, but when you held my hand, Suddenly, love was overflowing. <clears throat> I knew God, but when you showed me grace, when you forgave me, when you loved me, when you raised me. Suddenly, God was overflowing. So let us worship God together. Welcome. So <laughs> let us worship holy God together. Amen. Welcome everyone. We're here on the journey of Advent, awaiting, preparing, dreaming of God's promises of new life. And we begin by preparing ourselves, silencing that inner critic of our minds, centering our souls, welcoming all emotions and being fully embodied, experiencing all of our senses. And so join me in breathing in God's mercy and exhale out God's love and stretch now and extend a sign of peace to everyone here this morning. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who are here with us for the first time. 
those of you who have been away. And I would like to extend a special welcome to our guest composer, a friend and colleague of our music director, Gabrielle, singer composer, Sarah Grace Graves, who's written a commissioned piece for Skyline, the Magnificat, My Soul Magnifies the Light, that we will hear later today and we'll have a chance to discuss with the choir and also with Sarah and Gabrielle later in the service. Welcome everyone. If you have a special prayer request or a concern, or if you're here for the first time and you'd like us to know who you are, please sign in on the pew pad document in the order of worship. Um, otherwise just sign in on the chat or just send an email, a chat privately to me. So because of the nature of this service and the flow of today, we've moved up the announcements and the details are in your bulletins. I'd like to lift up just a few things. Today at the end of the service, as I just mentioned, we'll have a discussion with singer composer Sarah Grace Graves and Gabrielle and the choir ensemble immediately after the service. Tomorrow, Monday the 21st, is the longest night, the solstice service at 7 p.m. And this year is a spectacular year, the confluence of Saturn and Jupiter. Have any of you seen it yet? It is a time to embrace the darkness for all that we can see within the darkness. Um, the service is offered by Ken, Gabrielle, and myself, interfaith service with music, meditation, prayer, especially to embrace some of the emotions that we tend to bury and hide away in the darkness. On the 22nd at 7 p.m., we'll have a practice with all the readers in the Christmas Eve service. And on the 24th, Thursday, we will celebrate Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. I'd also like to thank the extraordinary generosity of the church and the preschool um, and Nancy Taylor in particular for um, coordinating our gift giving to the Children of East Oakland Community Project. Thank you, everyone. And our final announcement today, in addition to our regular offering, we have a special UCC offering. It's called the Annual Christmas Fund, and it is dedicated to active and retired clergy and lay employees of our denomination, the UCC. It provides emergency grants to our lower income retirees, which is especially important this year in the COVID pandemic. And so please give generously, and we now have the option of PayPal. And all of that information is in your bulletins. And we will now hear our opening song, Gabrielle. Thank you. 
Let us bow our heads together in prayer, prayer of confession. God of good news, you say to me, you are highly favored, but I struggle to see how I could be. You say to me, fear not, but I'm afraid all the time. You say to me, even the impossible is possible. Just look at Elizabeth, but hope slips through my hands like water. The impossible still feels impossible. So today I pray, God of a thousand names and none, teach us to sing like Mary, teach us all to laugh like Elizabeth, Teach us to trust the angels and forgive us when we can only do one at a time or none at all. Amen. And we'll now hear the music for preparation, Mike Workler. I'm going to play one of five dialogues that um, I wrote a number of years ago. And, you know, a dialogue is a, a talk between two people. And this could be a dialogue between you and God. It could be a dialogue between you and Mary. Um, it could be a dialogue between you and your best friend. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to add in there, it could be a dialogue between you and Jesus. But Nancy, Nancy um, reminded me that he's not born yet. So I'm going to have to wait for a week for that dialogue. Thank you, Mike. 
So uh, let us center ourselves for this morning's gospel reading. It is a very familiar reading. And we want to hear it in a new way. It's been um, called the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, which in Latin means it, it's the term is Magnificat. And so to hear it in a new way, I've selected Eugene Peterson's translation from the message. Hear these words from Luke's gospel, chapter one, verses 46b through 55. And Mary said, I'm bursting with good news. I'm dancing the song of my savior God. God took one good look at me and look what happened. I am the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe of him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattering the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel, he remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised, beginning with Abraham and right up to now. So ends our reading. Let us meditate on these words in the sanctuary of our hearts and minds. Please pray with me, come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle us in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit that we may all be renewed and you shall renew the face of the earth, amen. So to paraphrase once again, the late great John Lewis, that Holy Spirit has been stirring up all kinds of good trouble in Luke's gospel. Recall just last week, those of you who are here, the Holy Spirit stirred up good trouble with an elderly couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, leaving Elizabeth pregnant and her husband Zechariah silent, awaiting the birth of their miracle child. John, the great prophet, the baptizer, the one who would prepare the way. And now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Luke tells us, God once again sends that angel Gabriel, and this time to Elizabeth's teenage cousin, a virgin, Mary. Upon hearing the terrifying yet joyful good news, from the angel of another miraculous pregnancy, despite the dissonance of this inconceivable good news, Mary ultimately believes. And she wastes no time. She rushes off to be with Elizabeth. And the moment Elizabeth hears Mary's voice, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy Filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth sings exuberantly to Mary, you are so blessed among women and the babe in your womb also blessed. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord visits me? The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears, the babe in my womb skipped like a lamb for sheer joy, blessed woman, who believed what God said, 
believed every word would come true. And Mary, in response to this, filled with the Holy Spirit, responds in rapture, singing from the wellspring of her soul, my soul magnifies the Lord, in Latin, magnificat. And countless hymn writers, composers, gospel artists, choir masters have set and arranged these words with soaring melodies, steady bass lines, and descants to reach the rafters. These timeless words, the Magnificat, live on now, inspiring new composers, choir directors, and choristers. And today, at the end of the service, we will hear a new interpretation of the Magnificat, commissioned for Skyline. And I would like to thank our choir ensemble and our music director for their dedication. In a sense like Mary, they too are taking a spirit inspired leap of faith to add their voices to Mary's Magnificat. And each one of us as well is invited to take a spirit inspired leap of faith to align our dreams with those of God, to give birth to the still speaking, still singing God everywhere and in our lives. And so I'd like to share a few brief reflections about this well-known scripture from Luke. You know, so often when we have traditionally talked about Mary and the Magnificat, we tend to use words, especially about Mary in general, like surrender and obedience. And these are good words. They capture much of Mary's posture in this powerful and venerated prayer. But I'd like to not ascribe too much passivity to Mary's role in this Advent story and in the life of Jesus, because Mary did not just, did not only submit to God. Mary prepared for God. Mary dreamed with God. Mary aligned her hopes and her plans and her actions with God. And Mary birthed God. Mary prepared for God by paying attention to the prophets. To pay attention to the prophets is to align our dreams with God's dreams for our lives and for the world and to live accordingly. It is to go all in. It is to bet everything that God's justice will prevail and that love will ultimately win. Mary prepared for God by paying attention to the prophets and from the prophets she knew that God favors the marginalized over the powerful, the weak over the strong, the poor over the rich. She knew that God scatters the proud and lifts up the humble, that God never gives up, always surprises, always shows up. And Mary knew that God could very well use someone like her, an unmarried teenage girl, a minority in an occupied territory at a turbulent time in history to bring the Messiah into the world in the most unceremonious way through water and womb and blood and labor pains and lullabies and tender kisses and the vulnerability of a baby's cry. And so she said, yes, she believed. The Magnificat is not just an act of surrender. It is a creative embodied act a prophecy and a declaration in which Mary adds her own voice, her own dreams, her own body, her own plans for this baby and aligns them with the dreams and plans of God. And I believe that these dreams affected Mary's decisions as she raised Jesus and has, as she helped to shape Jesus into the person 
he would become. Mary embodies how God not only challenges us to believe the impossible, but also to participate in God's creative and redemptive work in our lives and in the world. Because God is in the business of making all things new. Advent reminds us that impossibly, amazingly, this is a collaborative effort. But I hear more within Mary's soul that's being magnified in the Magnificat. There is also an edge of anger, defiance, and restlessness within her soul. As the late best-selling author Rachel Held Evans wrote in 2017, when sung in a warm candlelit church at Advent, it can be so easy to blunt these words from the Magnificat to imagine them as symbolic, non-specific, comforting. But she continues, I'm not feeling sentimental this Advent. I'm feeling angry, restless. And so in this season, I hear Mary's Magnificat shouted, not sung. And remember this was in 2017. I can almost go there with her, almost because I too am needing a place to channel my rage about the perverse miscarriages of justice and decency that we have been witnessing on a daily basis for years in this country. I can almost go there. Because I'm angry and restless these days too, particularly now during the pandemic. But I will take a sung Magnificat over a shouted one any day. I'll take the singing right now because more than a channel to get my rage out, I need one that draws beauty and hope and even joy in. I need to open my heart and remind myself of the persistence of beauty in the world and with it, the spirit's endless, endlessly creative and generative presence within our midst. My soul needs art now more than ever to transform and to metabolize my grief and anger over what's happening in the world into compassion and reflection and action rather than mere raging and gut level reaction. So I invite us to imagine these words being expressed in a context other than a warm candlelit church or living room this Advent. Because all of scripture and all of life really, context is everything. And so imagine the Magnificat being shared in other settings. For example, in the halls of the Capitol building he has filled the hungry with good news and has sent the rich away empty. In the corridors of the West Wing, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. In the streets of Minneapolis, Louisville, and right here in Oakland, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Among women who have survived assault, harassment, and rape, he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Among the poor, the refugees, the victims of gun violence, and the faithful ministers of the gospel who at great cost are speaking out against the false religions of nationalism and white supremacy. His mercy is upon those who fear him from generation to generation. 
the Magnificat in context as sung or shouted in the centers of power, in spaces of poverty and racism and degradation in the face of empire. And don't let these pretty little advent candles fool you. This is our context too. It is this context that we need to see and hear and believe in these sacred texts so that our souls too magnify the light, the fire, the love of God. And for me, singing is key. A song, even the gentlest of lullabies when sung in the midst of cold hearted injustice can be profoundly more defiant than any full throated rallying cry. In fact, I would claim that defiance is what sets the tone of the Magnificat, no matter what its form. Listen for it, tune your ears to it, tune your soul to it, for the sounds of spiritual defiance. The Magnificat carries in it defiant beauty, fearless hope, and spirit-filled joy whatever form it takes. Listen for it in the sermon response, Mary, Mary, don't you keep quiet. Listen for it as we hear our closing hymn, my soul magnifies the light. Hear it in the defiance that makes a profound theological claim, namely that God is the God of the oppressed. God resists with the marginalized, with the poor and takes sides. Quoting Evans again, not with the powerful, but the humble, not with the rich, but the poor, not with the occupying forces, but with people on the margins, not with narcissistic kings, but with an unwed, unbelieved teenage girl and trusted with the holy task of birthing and nursing and nurturing God. This is the stunning claim of the incarnation. God has made a home among the very people the world casts aside. And in her defiant prayer, Mary, a dark-skinned woman, a refugee, a religious minority in an occupied land names this reality. God is with us. And if God is with us, who can stand against us? May our souls magnify the Lord, the love, the light, the grace-filled, glorious welcome and desperately, desperately needed sound of spiritual defiance. May we, like Mary, ponder these words within the depths of our souls. And may these words lead us from anger to compassion, from despair to hope, from indecency to beauty, from restlessness to peace. Amen. Ring the bell, play the horn, play the harp and cymbal. Sing, sing till the night resounds with song. Ring the bell, play the harp, play the drums and cymbal.
Skyline has sung it. Fifty Christmases, Skyline's bell has rung it. Now we walk an uncharted road. Still our souls will sing our praise to God. Amen. And at this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce Sarah Grace Graves um, to just say a few words about the inspiration for this piece that we're about to hear. Hello, everybody. Hi, Sarah. Um, it's so nice to be here. Greetings from the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm in the uh, Franco-Italian Alps. Um, I was, I'm yeah, it's a, it's a long story, like a lot of stuff that's happened this year, um, but I'm incredibly grateful to be here and um, be here with you. Um, I wanted to say some things about um, my music and spirituality and sort of how I approached this piece that you're about to hear. Um, for me, Musical improvisation shapes my understanding of prayer. Mm. Improvisation is an expression of my soul. It's spontaneously expressive like speech, but it goes beyond words to uncover hidden truths about my self-image, emotional state, mm -hmm. and my relationship to other people and to my instrument, things that maybe I wouldn't be able to admit to myself if I were thinking about them. Mm -hmm on their face, but, you know, through music, I can um, understand a lot of things more deeply. And it feels fitting for me as an improviser to set the Magnificat a prayer in a, par a partially improvised format, because prayer also is an expression of the soul. And you find out things about your hopes and your fears and your relationships that you had never before articulated to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's an outpouring and it goes beyond words. Mm -hmm. In this Zoom Magnificat, I wanted to capture some of the emotions Mary might have been feeling based on her prayer in the Gospel of Luke. Mm -hmm. The prayer speaks of a world in righteous upheaval with the mighty brought low and the humble lifted up. I wanted to capture this upheaval while also leaving room for the personal. The piece is partially improvised in part to allow for live musical expression in a virtual format. Um, and it features vocal sound that moves fluidly between speaking and singing, mm -hmm. magnifying the embodied personhood of each performer. Something that is beautiful to remain aware of during this time of connection at a distance. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
just exactly the thing. Um, so if, uh, if that's good, we might just move into the performance. It's a big, exciting moment. Um, so uh, we in rehearsal have been starting our rehearsals of this piece with little meditations. Um, so I want to start the same way with all of us here. Um, so I'm going to talk us through it, and then we're going to fluidly go into the performance. And we would invite you to kind of behind the privacy of your muted mic, <laughs> join us, you know, if you feel so moved to sing along, to speak words. Yeah. So um, let's take a series of um, breaths. So first breath, breathe in, center down. Keep that going. This piece starts with a series of four really evocative ideas. So we're gonna think of those as we breathe. So take a breath in and think of the idea of supply. Where do you draw your resources from? What energizes you in your day-to-day -day life? Next breath, center. What is your true authenticity? How is that connected to your spirituality? Next breath, spirit. Final breath, soul. What part of us exists beyond the physical? What is our truth beyond the fears and worries that preoccupy us every day? And one last breath to let that all settle. My supply. 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 My center. My center. My center. My center. My center. My center. My spirit. My spirit. My spirit. My spirit. Spirit. My soul. 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 My soul.
Ami. Thank you so much, choir and Sarah Grace. And I would. 